Well done for making it this far. Congratulations, you've got the Longevity Award. Um, just quick introductions because we are running a little bit late and it's keeping you from all your mounds of marking you're going off to do. So we'll, um, we'll go from the far side. We have Sir Tim Brighouse, um, who I probably don't need to introduce anymore, Tim. You've been around a long time. Uh, Manira Mirza, uh, Deputy Mayor of London with Education as a Portfolio. Lord Andrew Adonis, ex-Schools Minister, and Louise Thomas from the Innovation Unit. The intention is they're going to talk very briefly, very briefly, five minutes-ish, um, on what they see for the future of education in London, and then open it up to questions. Any volunteers to go first? Tim, well done. Uh, right. Well, I'm going to be a bit off the point, but very quick, which is I think you have to understand contexts ever to, to get things right. And contexts change over time, they change in places. And one of the problems with the schooling system in England is that it is 47 million people that are being served. And there is a danger of treating those as very similar contexts. They're not. Uh, and I think that when I look back, when I went, I, I was education officer in Oxfordshire in 1978. Very quickly, in the three months before I was a, uh, went there, they decided, the council decided to publish exam results in order that parents might make a better choice of school. This is 15 years before a national decision was taken to do that. I was also told by the leader to go and have supper with an ex-councillor who was, going to, was working in a bank and was definitely going to be a power in the land should the Conservatives get elected in 79. His name was John Redwood. And I went and had a meal with John Redwood and heard what actually was going to come. So I went back and thought, right, I lived in a world of partnerships and trust and laissez-faire, and things went really rather well. I must realise that there is doubts and disillusion. There have been William Tyndale, there have been Rising Hill, there have been student unrest, etc. We're going to move into a, a world of markets and accountability. I didn't realise that we're going to move into such a world of managerialism. But you will be aware of that. So the white papers ever since the 80s have emphasised, emphasised choice, autonomy and um, diversity. And on the other hand, equality and equity. And most governments have used regulation in order to limit the effects of markets in order to promote equity and equality. I will stick to my five minutes. Right? I will. Right. right, you'll tell me to. I will. Very quickly, I think we are now seeing that having been played out. People are getting a bit fed up with the extremes of markets and the extremes of managerialism. And therefore, you have to look at, well, what's coming next? I would say partnership of schools is coming next. I think there will be a college of teaching. All the parties are agreed about it. And let's hope that that means that decisions taken in the future will be evidence-driven. That's another factor that's coming into play, evidence. There is a general agreement that Ofsted needs reform. Some would want more than that. Um, and I think it does need reform. I think, I think if you're going to trust teachers more, you're going to have teachers much more in the driving seat than they have been since markets were introduced. So I think there's change coming. Included in that would be a wish to reduce the power of the centre, and particularly the Secretary of State, who's now got 2,000 powers. And for my money, that will be in regional development I mean, you've only got to look at Scotland and what we call it, Manchester, whatever it is. Um, it's going in that direction. Now, in London, there are 8 million. That is much more uh, comparable with some of the other countries. So I would say hand over certain powers uh, to you uh, as the mayor and the GLA over education, and in particular do that because I think if you don't have something, some glue to hold London together, it will in the end, all the things we did will begin to evaporate and disappear. Because, you know, recruiting the right number of teachers, etc., etc., is really powerful. So my big thing would be to say, consider the context, and in particular for London, let's have done with this. 
there are certain powers which the mayor and the GLA should have that perhaps we exercised in the London challenge. Thank you. Minim, I'm going to leave you to last, if that's okay. Yeah. Andrew. Um, I basically agree with what Tim has said in terms of um, the school system. I think the biggest challenge actually isn't to do with what goes on in the schools, but what school leavers go on to do where there isn't sufficient provision at the moment. And, and the big area where there's a massive gap in provision is apprenticeships and vocational routes beyond school. And as I look back on the last 10 years, and it's important to be self-critical about this too, we spent inordinate amounts of time reforming universities. Um, some of that was necessary. I mean, it, it, there, there did need to be a new financial settlement for universities and uh, the higher education sector was important. And we also needed to significantly increase the numbers going on to university. And that's been a dramatic change in the last generation as we moved from one in 10 to uh, one in, uh, in uh, nearly one in three going on to university. We haven't brought about anything like the scale of change and improvement in vocational routes beyond school. And in particular, because in my whole experience in this game, you've got to keep your propositions and your ambitions simple if you want to uh, bring about big change. The simple reform that we need, which I hope that the next government, whoever forms it, will uh, address themselves to, is a transformation in the quality and quantity of apprenticeships for school leavers. It's important to understand what's happened in the last few years. The figures, the national figures for apprenticeships are entirely misleading because there's been a, a massive amount of churn and rebadging of work-based work training um, schemes for, for employees in their 20s. The number of and proportion of 16 to 21 year olds going into apprenticeships has actually fallen over the last five years. And amongst the cohort of 18 to 19 year olds, it's um, less than 10%. The equivalent figure in Germany is nearly 30%. And in London, London has a particularly, because the service sector has been very bad at, at creating apprenticeships, London has a lower proportion, a lower proportion of its 18 to 19 year olds going into apprenticeships than the national average, and I think is three from the bottom of, of regions nationally in the provision of apprenticeships. So though some of us celebrate the London challenge and the big improvements that we've seen in London schools. In terms of the opportunities available for London school leavers who are not on track to go to university, they are not good and are arguably worse than those available for um, school leavers elsewhere. So what's the single biggest challenge that I think we've got to uh, tackle in the next five years? It is to dramatically improve the quality and quantity of apprenticeships for London school leavers. Thank you. Louise. We have far too much agreement at this festival so far. young people cannot be successful and so we need to stop looking at the young people as the problem and start looking at what we might reinvent schools to be like to enable every single young person to be successful. We know these models exist, we know there are practices and models but sometimes it takes us to be a bit brave and to actually rethink what we do in terms of school, not just in the classroom but actually rethinking about whether or not the whole frame is appropriate for every single young person. But that's not the same as changing the, what we expect from young people. It's not about dumbing down, it's not about changing the outcomes. In fact, quite the opposite, I think we can, we can expect um, uh, very, very high outcomes from every young person. However, I also think the second gap is between the outcomes that we know we need and we hear from employers and universities that they want from young people and they, that we as a society and as a civilization need from our young people, which is as many as possible to be creative, collaborative, be able to interact with those from different backgrounds and different cultures, to be able to communicate, to be able to be authentic, to have ethics, to be acting and problem solving and creating new possibilities in the world for all of our sakes. And we need to expect that from children from every community, not just from those that traditionally have fulfilled those functions in our society. And the gap between what we measure currently and how we hold our schools to account 
and all of those things is, is probably a more important gap. So yes, it's about getting, making sure that children from every background can have high outcomes, but at the same time, rethinking what those outcomes are. And apprenticeships are a fantastic way of doing that. And finally, this is a global conversation. We work with South Korea, with Finland, with New York, with Kentucky, with Colorado, British Columbia, with Brazil, with India, high-performing jurisdictions and emerging powerhouse economies to start rethinking some of these outcomes questions. They are collaborating around developing new metrics for measuring complex thinking and collaborative problem solving and other things that they know they need. They look at their young people with fantastic math results and say they're not what we need. We need those math results, we need that deep knowledge, we need that deep cultural transference between generations, but it's not enough. How do we together find the solutions? And I would argue that we are not currently, as a country, sufficiently part of that conversation. I think London is in an incredibly powerful position, given the successes of the last 10 to 15 years, to join that conversation and begin to think seriously about different models of schooling, but also different kinds of outcomes and how we measure those on behalf of the whole country. Thank you. And finally, Manira. Uh, so, as others have already said, London uh, is in a much stronger position than it was uh, 20 years ago. It's a very high-performing uh, region internationally, and not just in the UK, uh, and uh, a number of very good news stories. So, the number of NEETs has actually reduced quite considerably in the last few years. It's halved from about 7% to 3.5. Um, we've seen an uptake in certain subjects like languages in the last few years, partly because of the EBAT, but also, I think, because of a, a, a real uh, mission uh, in London schools to try and give those students the, um, uh, the best quality education and, and not dumb down. Um, and uh, there have been lots of improvements in leadership and, and partnership working and so on. So um, I would pick out three areas where I think uh, London still needs to improve or where things have uh, not been given sufficient attention. Um, the first is uh, teacher training, ongoing teacher training and professional development. And we've done quite a lot of work on this in the GLA, looking particularly at subject-specific CPD, where there's really just not that much going on. There's not enough. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, activity around leadership, which is, of course, important. But giving classroom teachers the ability to reflect on their subject, to reflect on their own subject knowledge, uh, where um, some of the projects we've done, like the London Schools Excellence Fund, have highlighted where teachers are and sometimes have deficiencies, and uh, that's not their fault because they've not been given the support to uh, spend time with uh, their own uh, their community of subject specialists. So that's one of the areas where I think uh, London schools, if they are going to continue to improve, and particularly for those students who are in the middle and the top, as well as those at, uh, at the lowest attaining levels, I think teachers need to be given more encouragement and support to do uh, more professional development. The second area, um, which uh, Andrew's already highlighted, is um, post-16. Uh, and uh, I think there's a, a, a real problem, which is the very high dropout rate, rate, sorry, very high dropout rate for students at 17. Uh, it's much higher, actually, than the rest of the country. So whereas London is doing very well for pre-16, uh, there's something going on at post-16 uh, in terms of participation. And I think that has a lot to do with the things that Andrew said about the quality of vocational education on offer, uh, the kind of advice and guidance that are given to students, and the fact that many schools are incentivized to try and keep students within their school and not send them to the local FE college. There is a real issue around FE and the quality of FE teaching and leadership. And we have very good FE colleges in London, but we also have ones which have issues. And one of the things that the GLA is doing, we have a responsibility now for FE capital and some schools devolution. I think we need to look at the number of FE colleges in London and think about rationalizing and departments and colleges merging and coming together and trying to become, uh, rather than every single FE college having an excellent construction department, maybe looking at joining forces. We have a very mobile student population, but our FE colleges haven't kept pace. And I think apprenticeships is part of that. Um, that, that discussion. And then third and finally, um, the issue of school places. London is a city that is growing extremely fast. Uh, there are whole new areas of London that, that are being regenerated, new, new housing developments are going up. And it's incredibly important that schools are factored into those plans. And I think that we are, um, many boroughs will say that they feel that they're at stretching point, they're at, they're at crisis point. Uh, there is work that we do at the GLA uh, to collect data and to look at uh, where the numbers are growing rapidly. 
But I think more needs to be done to uh, increase the amount of land that's available for school development, allow us to do more uh, intervention on planning, uh, to work more closely with boroughs, uh, to try and be more strategic about school places planning. Um, that means free schools and uh, local authorities extending their schools. It's across the board. But I think structurally, that's, that's something that needs to be looked at. And whether that means a middle tier or more powers to the mayor, I always like being on a panel with him because he wants to give me more powers whenever I sit next to him. But I think there is something that needs to be looked at there. Thank you. Um, over to you. You've had a day of being bombarded. That's how I feel. I don't know about you. But there must be some questions for some people that may have some answers. So uh, we have some microphones. Yes. Are there any? There we go. We have one right in front of you there and one there. Perfect. Ah, that, that looks like Mr. Young. Thank you, Vic. Um, Tim Brickhouse said, and I agree with him, that um, evidence is going to play a bigger and bigger role when it comes to evaluating educational policy. One bit of evidence that I'd like the panel to respond to is the evidence that the London challenge had a negligible impact and can't really claim credit for the high attainment of pupils in London. I'd like the panel's response to the paper by Simon Burgess for the Centre for Market and Public Organisation published last October, which said that the reason uh, London pupils are high attainers, higher than the rest of the country by and large, is because of the high concentration of black, Asian and minority ethnic students in London who've been coming here in increasing numbers during the period in which we've exceeded all these expectations. And actually, if you look at the performance of white British pupils in London schools, which you'd expect to be better if there was a London challenge effect and compare it to white British pupils in the rest of the country, there's no difference at all. So the evidence suggests that the London challenge uh, was completely ineffective. Thank you. Tim. Well, uh, Toby reminds me of a political leader. Can I just please be careful what you're going to no, say? No, I'm, I'm, I'm just checking. I am. He reminds me of a political leader who came to me when I was in the ILEA and he said exasperatedly, it was my job, he said, for heaven's sake, can't you give me a one-armed researcher? So I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, all your research can say, on the one hand this, and on the other hand that. And I, as a politician, need one answer. Uh, well, an economist who says that the difference in London is entirely down to the ethnicity of pupils would have to ask questions about, well, what happened in Bradford? You know, what happened in Oldham? What happened in Leicester? None of that research is there, except to say that something similar happened in Birmingham. I can only guess as to what the similarities are between the two. What I would say to you quite seriously is that there is never one answer. Uh, one of the issues that makes me think the London Challenge made some difference was that it didn't propose one answer. Uh, it actually tackled it on a number of fronts. So, for instance, if we hadn't worked together, we wouldn't have got Teach First off the ground. I think Teach First did contribute. Um, we did something on CPD, a Chartered London Teacher idea. Uh, I actually think we probably affected the disposition of the leaders of schools and teachers marginally in the right direction. I think we had a theory of school improvement, which we didn't say, you all do this but would you like to consider X, Y, and Z? We did it in a Socratic way rather than a dictatorial way. Uh, and personally, I think I wouldn't like to say which one factor had an influence, but unless you have somebody holding the system together, London will run into another crisis. That's my view. That's why I think it's so important. Uh, you have referred to a places problem. There is. There will be a problem, again, on teacher supply. There is an issue about CPD. And I think somebody ought to be looking at that overall and speculating about what we need to do to solve those issues. That isn't to say, Toby, that I don't think that all kids can't achieve. They certainly can. And I could take you to a school in London. I was there the other week, uh, Broadford School on Harold Hill, and I would say, go there, white working class, fantastic performance, all pursuing some of the issues that we would advocate for change. 
Thank you. Any other comments, Andrew? I, I haven't seen the research, and I will look at it, Toby, and uh, come back to you. But I, I, it sounds to me distinctly implausible for two reasons. Firstly, that uh, the minority communities in London had been m the, the biggest community, the Black African and Caribbean community, had been significantly underperforming yeah. before London Challenge. When I became minister, looking at all these charts, the big, the single biggest challenge we faced, you're quite right, it's now, the white working class, the single biggest challenge then was the, uh, was the black Caribbean community, which had been dramatically underperforming historically. I think from memory it was about half the average level of performance at um, key stage uh, 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 two and, um, and four of, um, of, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the high, higher performing social groups, and that was regarded as a massive challenge. It, the interplay be between ambitious minority communities and good schools is what I think has driven improvement in London over the last 10 years. It's no good having ambitious communities and very weak schools, because the ambitious communities can't educate themselves. They don't actually require the good schools. And as I've seen school after school, it's the co it, and I see it really in spades in the areas I know very well, like my own uh, local borough of Islington, where you've got now well-managed, well-staffed, well-resourced schools with very ambitious um, uh, communities of parents, some of whom are, are from, uh, uh, from uh, different ethnic groups, then that is, gives you a real multiplier effect. And I think it's the combination of the elements of the London Challenge, which Tim has referred to, Teach First, Academies, investment in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in teachers more broadly, the, um, the, the mentoring of the, the systematic partnership of head teachers from weaker schools with head teachers from stronger schools, which is one of the key elements of uh, London Challenge. A particular focus on maths and science teachers and recruiting them in, uh, including from minority communities. All of those elements of the London Challenge transform the leadership and quality of schools, which hand in hand with the dynamism of the parents, I think is what produced the big improvement. The other point I'd make finally is that is, without naming names, there are some other cities that have very large, very large migrant communities um, and have very poor results. So it clearly isn't the case that the, the uh, if you look at other uh, cities, that the answer to having a successful and above average performance school system is, uh, is, uh, is to be underrepresented with the white working class. Thank you. Another question just there. Thank you, uh, Joe Dilga, Educational Governance and Enterprise Consultant. Just wanted to pick up on Louise's point, but just ask a, a question based on it. Louise mentioned about young people being well prepared or not for the world of work. And uh, some or all of the panel may have seen earlier this month, the Commission for Employment and Skills actually reported in their Catch 1624 report that generally young people are well prepared for the world of work, but there's more to be done. Uh, and that as young people go through the education system from about 52% at 16 to when they graduate um, if they go to university, so over 80% are well prepared for the world of work. I just wondered it, in terms of London schools, if any of the panel had any comments on that, because those kind of statistics aren't often put in the media. Thank you. Maniwa? Well, I'm always slightly wary whenever I see reports about whether children are prepared for work or not, and particularly when business associations or employer associations talk about why aren't schools educating people so that they're perfectly equipped to do the job day one when they walk in. The reality is that that's not the job of schools. Schools can do some aspects of preparing young people for life and work in a global city, but their primary job is to educate young people and to give them the kind of knowledge and the skills that they will need to progress. But, but there's always going to be a gap and I think businesses have to step up and take some of that responsibility too. Um, I think, you know, my, my own view is uh, that if you educate young people in subjects, and, um, you know, I do think disciplines are worthwhile, and, and there's, a, there's a role for project activity as well, but I think primarily if you educate people in subjects, um, they are then able to make decisions and make choices at the age of 16 about which to specialise in and which to go on to. Um, that's not to say you can't have lots of extracurricular activity, you can't have things that promote soft skills, public speaking, debating, etc. But there are some foundational uh, aspects of education which are really important. And unfortunately, what's happened in this country, and not just in London, is the downgrading of some of those academic subjects to encourage students to do uh, lower quality vocational subjects because they're seen as easier. And I think that that's a disservice to vocational education and to the academic 
uh, education as well. So um, that's, my, that's my sort of take on it, that it's about educating children and then you, you think about employment and so on um, as a, a process that comes uh, slightly afterwards as well. Thank you, Louise. You mentioned this in your... Certainly. I've just got to two points. Um, one, 80% is great, but 20% of the people in the university degree that will go debt are ready for work, which is you know, probably, like you said, there's more to be done. Um, but I would say that I'm going to borrow a phrase of Gartrax and I don't think it's here today, but um, you're never not in the business of teaching your skills. But you can teach the Tudors, and I'm paraphrasing now, and invite young people to sit still and listen for an hour at a time and to copy from the board and get the right answer. Or you can teach the Tudors through having inviting young people to inquire, to think for themselves, to be critically minded, to engage with sources, and to collaborate with one another on producing some new knowledge in response to uh, texts. It's a, it's a basic class of example, but the point is it's not as every sound game, I don't think. I don't think we need to choose between an academic curriculum and preparing young people for the kinds of rapidly changing careers that we are they're likely to go on to have now. Um, I think we can do both and we can do it both at the same time. And I think if we're smart, we're looking really, really closely at the world of work and how it's changing. Because schools are the only public institutions that are systematically and only there to prepare for the future. Yes, it's a cultural transmission, yes, there's a socialisation, but it's all for something, and it's for these young people's futures. And if we're not being really forensic and really smart about what those are likely to be, because although it's unpredictable, we do know some things, and I don't think we're systematically applying them well enough in our schools and in how we measure how well our schools are doing in that situation. So I don't think it's about either or, I think it's about getting a little bit smarter and a little bit more future oriented. Maneira, you probably want to come back on that, do you? Um, you know, I, the school curriculum is pretty um, stretched, and so every decision you make about what you teach, there's an opportunity cost. And, um, and I would argue that actually, if you look at, and this comes out of the work that we've done with the Excellence Fund, and we've, we've looked at how um, teaching and how teachers are supported um, in their training, um, the emphasis has been very much on the more kind of the, soft, the, so, the sort of things that you're talking about, how to get students to inquire and um, how to facilitate discussion in classroom and all those things. And they're, they're worthwhile, but I think the thing that has been neglected in the last few years is the attention to subjects, uh, to teachers uh, understanding and knowing their subjects and being able to impart that. And when you were talking about sitting quietly for an hour and listening and absorbing, Actually, that's one of the things that you actually need to know if you're going to go into the world of work, to be able to sit still and listen and learn in a, in a didactic way. And I think that we have shied away from that in this country to some extent. And it, it's made to sound elitist and traditionalist. Uh, but actually, it's a, you know, it is the gateway to learning and, and to creativity, I think. I wouldn't argue it's part of it. Thank you. I think there's a huge shortage of work experience opportunities for um, uh, for 14 to 18 year olds, and that does need to be addressed. I think it was a big mistake to remove work experience from the, uh, from the curriculum. I think that needs to come back again. And if you look at the big trend in universities at the moment, the huge trend is towards uh, in internships and a massive expansion of internships for university students, which is turning what used to be, in my day, you know, vocation courses and things like that into a much more, more uh, um, in-depth and, um, and, and systematic engagement with, uh, with future employers. And we need the same to happen between employers and schools. Thank you. We'll move on. A colleague at the front here with the microphone there. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Amanda Wilson. I'm a deputy head in Greenwich and also a school governor in Newham. And one of the things that we found at the school where I'm a governor is that the number of free schools that are opening up in, in Newham is actually affecting our pupil numbers and... Um, the London Academy of Excellence, which opened up in Stratford, has taken some of our better students. And obviously, I understand being a parent myself that it's important parents have choice. But what do you think can be done to ensure that the number of free schools that are opening doesn't then dilute the, the pupil numbers in existing, existing schools? Minira, you mentioned free schools and numbers. and Yeah. I mean... It there are two things going on. There's a desire to increase the number of school places generally. So um, in boroughs like Newham, there is a shortage of places, and inevitably schools will have to be created. And the presumption at the moment is that they are schools outside local authority control. Um, so you will get a, a degree of competition. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there is a, you know, there is a real tension within, between schools. So uh, 
wanting to attract students means that you're constantly pitted against the, the school that's a neighbour to you. That doesn't mean, I think, that you, you only have competition, you only have a market. I think there are schools that recognise that there is value in working together as well. And in some cases, specialist free schools which are set up, which are either at sixth form, which may be STEM um, schools, but I know that, that one has um, set up in, in Newham, I think also have a lot to offer. And what I would hope is that over the coming years, as schools uh, settle in, as there's a, a kind of greater uh, 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 feeling of community and, and connection uh, between schools, that there'll be more partnership working. But the reality is there is a degree of competition, and it's that choice, it's that uh, system that arguably keeps schools uh, trying to get even better, trying to attain uh, better results for their students. Where's, just out of interest, because I'm really interested in this point of view, and I'm beginning to doubt whether it is wise to give you uh, more power over education. But, 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 but where, just ask the simple question... Where is the evidence in other countries that that degree of competition actually produces outcomes that improve disproportionately to others? Where, where is there that evidence? Um, because I don't know of it. Well, there's some evidence in, in Britain that the Academies programme, which was started under the previous government, was continued under the current one. Uh, but how about the House uh, of Commons Select report, which suggests that actually that they've researched all the evidence and they can find no either plus or minus? It's not that I'm anti that, uh, but I'm just anxious that we look at the evidence, as I know uh, the first questioner was as well. And I don't know the evidence. Andrew? Uh, I'm not sure this is a, a debate worth having in the sense that my understanding from the Mayor of Newham is that Newham is desperately short of school places. And that the, uh, the big, we've got a, a burgeoning population in Newham, huge shortage of primary places, and there is a demand for more secondary places. So insofar as what's been happening with the free schools in Newham has been enabling the, um, uh, the system to provide enough places and to reduce the need to move out of borough, then it's worthwhile. The crucial issue then is if you need the additional places, and my understanding is that you do need them in Newham, obviously, unless you're mad, you create the places in institutions that are going to be good. Now, I know some of the uh, quote-unquote free schools in Newham. There's my good friend Peter Hyman and School 21, which is doing an outstandingly good job, you know, top-rated by Ofsted, phenomenal opportunities. The London Academy of Excellence, didn't they get something like eight people into Cambridge last year? And they've got, uh, they're the only, one of the only schools in and London the, that teaches... And Andrew, that, the that new teaches, Vic Sixth you know, Form College, which it is in direct mm. competition with, got more places in yeah, Oxford and Cambridge. But the, but the point about it is that if you need the additional places, and my understanding is that in UM you do, then obviously it's sensible to create those places and to give them to providers who are going to have high quality I don't, un, I don't see this as a, an increase in competition in the context of, uh, of this big demand for additional places. I think the challenge is, and this is the case for most free schools, and it, you, know, you can look at um, Hackney New School as another example, is that, they're, that yes, they're understandable that there are places required within the borough, but as to whether it's just picking a plot of land as opposed to the, the right end of the borough, Whichever, whether it's Newham, whether it's Hackney, whether it's Islington, it's actually being mindful that um, if there's a new school opening um, near uh, the, the docks, then it takes away from the schools that are actually struggling to fill their places, not because they're not good schools or improving schools, but because the pupils are being diluted in other places. I mean, in, in, in a city like London, where most students uh, do travel, uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about schools and, and local schools for local communities, actually there's a huge amount of mobility across borders, uh, borough borders as well. Uh, and there is a challenge of finding land. Land isn't always conveniently available where you want a school. The point is that where there is a demand for school places generally in London, in a, in a, in a region of London, uh, you do need to create those places and there will be an immediate effect on the neighbouring schools. But over time, uh, that should settle down and there should be, I hope, a recognition that these schools have a role to play, that they can be uh, great for their students, they can be great for a community. And I think that, you know, that, that sense of resentment that there are, there's somebody new turning up on your patch, uh, I hope that, that people will see that it makes sense to have good new providers around. Thank you. I'm very aware Chris is hovering, but somebody's been given a microphone, so I'm going to give you a chance to answer your question. Have you been given a microphone up there? Yes. Perfect. Um, Thank you. I'm a deputy head teacher in a secondary school in West London, we had a £300,000 budget cut last year. 
we have a £500,000 budget cut this year. My question to the panel um, from all London schools, what do we cut? Over the next few years, there are going to be further financial cuts. What, what should we cut? Manira. Um, that's a great question, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great question. Sorry, was your question, can I just ask, was your question what should we cut in schools? Or yeah. what, what else should we cut? We, yes. you know, my head teacher... Yeah. She'd like some advice. Okay. We, we've I, had I, two rounds of redundancies. Um, yeah. who, who should go? What should we cut? While still raising standards, sorry. Okay. I mean, I, I can't answer in each individual school which is the bit of their budget that they feel, they feel is the... Um, what about generically, Manira? But, but one point I would make is that, and it's, this point has been raised in the media before, is that schools, individual schools, have quite large reserves now. And... Um, uh, we're uh, not allowed them with the local authority. Academies have very large the, reserves, the, but local authority schools, as we are, we, we're not allowed them. We've been... That's that's stopped them. But these individual um, schools, academies, um, have large reserves, and there may be a case for... Um, rather than letting them sit in deposits. Uh, in, um, uh, can we ask, can, for schools that haven't got big carry okay. forwards, can you give us some general advice on what I should lose while still raising standards in order to keep our schools moving in the direction we want to move? That's what was being asked. Not the ones okay. who've got the money, it's the ones who haven't got the money. Well, I can't, I can't say for each individual school what they should cut. It could be that based on the evidence about classroom teach, uh, teaching assistants, there's been lots of debate about whether teaching assistants actually do help improve school standards. I mean, that's something that your school has to decide on its own. But I can't possibly tell you uh, what you as an individual school uh, should prioritise or not. I, I, I think it would be useful for London, you know, we, we were in a time when there was more money coming in and we had a lot of advice about how to spend the money. I, I do, I mean, this is a serious point and the mayor's office would be good people to do this. I greatly respect the work that you do, but, it, but genuinely advice about how to save money, how to be more effective. Thank you. Um, we need to wrap up, because it's six o'clock. Oh, Tim, well, sorry, well, no, I, I can't. I want if, to know Tim's if, answer if, to if, that so question. Tim, so, so yeah. Tim, you no, have no, to have the right to answer. No, no, that was really unfair on her there. I oh, mean, massively. I mean, but that was great. I mean, I, I absolutely accept with your point that it's context-bound. That is to say, it'll be a different answer in different places. Of course it will. Uh, but the, there are difficult choices to be made, and I think not to have an airing of this is a great pity, because that's going to happen. Whether we want it to or not, it's going to happen. Now, I've lived through a period where that happened before, and the one thing I beg you to prioritise, if people said to me, what would you do? The first thing I'd protect is teachers' professional development. I'd put the budget up on teachers' professional development. And if it meant class sizes slightly higher, then I would take that. Now, that is a highly unpopular thing. I'm meant to be a teacher's friend, right? <laughs> and I am a teacher's friend, and frankly, I hate the idea of education cuts, but if I've got to uh, work on the evidence about class size, about things that make a difference, I please do not cut teacher professional development. It refreshes their intellectual curiosity, it gives them energy, and they will do things. And I've had experience of that over 10 years, a long time ago in Oxfordshire, where we did protect professional development. And do you know, people look back on that period, and I think we cut all sorts of things, including making the pupil-teacher ratio worse. They regard it as a golden age. Why? Because the ideas were flowing, the intellectual curiosity was there, and they felt the energy to do things. So my plea is, you're going to have to look at staffing. You can't make cuts like that. It may well be, but don't go for the easy option of the teaching assistant. It may not be that is the answer, but you are going to have to reduce staffing. But please, please, please don't cut staff development budgets. The Andrew, the Grim Reaper is hovering over there, okay, so I you have so just in a nutshell. Into land. <laughs> if, if, I, if I can make a, a part of political but factual point, a big choice at the, current, the, at the next election is whether you want yeah, to yeah. maintain spending in nominal terms, which is what the Conservatives said, or the commitment we've given, which is to maintain per, per pupil spending in real terms. And uh, maintaining it in real terms will ensure that, uh, that there's more budget to uh, go around in the first place. Thank you, Toby. Chris. Okay, so the great thing... Thanks, the, Toby. Okay, Your right to reply is in the sun so the, tomorrow, I'd the imagine. Really, the really good thing is that we've got a discussion we can continue. Um, 
the editor of the Tez has just asked me something I never thought I'd hear, uh, hear a journalist ask. She said, Chris, where's the bar? <laughs> we hope you're all going to come to the bar with us, the Union Bar, if you go out the back, up the stairs, or if you go up into the main building and down to level three. I want to thank Vic, I want to thank Louise, I want to thank Andrew, I want to thank Munira, I want to thank Tim, I want to thank everybody. Come and have a drink with us, carry on the discussion, great day, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.